when I was in college, I was a really big fan of boy bands. Not like I owned all their CDs. Like I owned all their CDs, I taped all of their programs, I went to all their concerts, I would have traveled to go to more of their concerts if I could have afforded it. I had an entire ceiling of boy band faces on my senior college room. Like I literally got a chair and just taped everything up and you could lay on the floor and as far as you can see. I went to Oberlin, which is a uh, Midwestern liberal arts college that's kind of known for being progressive. And it has the third best conservatory in the United States. So as you can imagine, when people found this out, I tended to fall in their esteem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one day I was telling a friend about it. He was kind of a scallywag, but I liked him anyway. And, uh, and he, he was acting really judgy. And I said, man, I felt less stressed out when I came out to you. And he goes, well, when you came out to me, I didn't have to reconsider who you were as a human being. <laughs> and we laugh because it's funny. But it also says a lot about how we judge each other on the pleasures, that the way we derive pleasure. When ebooks became a big thing, the, the genre that far outsold any other genre, and in fact out, re, outsold itself in print, which really wasn't seen in any other genre, was romance novels. And when people started to look into why this was, the answer was pretty unanimously the same. And it was, well, because now nobody has to see the cover of what I'm reading. <laughs> nobody has to know that I'm reading a romance novel. The, so the same thing sort of happened with Harry Potter. When Harry Potter was really popular, the London publisher created adult covers for it. So if you've ever seen, there are covers for each and every book that are pictures instead of illustrations. And it was so that adult readers could read the books on like the train or whatever, and nobody would have to know that they were reading a children's book. Which is weird, right? Like, when we just say it like that, it's funny. I used to have this argument with my ex-boyfriend where I would say, there's no such thing as a guilty pleasure. And he would say, what are you talking about? Of course there are guilty pleasures. And I said, no, 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 no. Guilt is something that we're meant to feel when we do something bad when we hurt somebody, when we do something wrong. I was like, I'll give you this. If you're going out and murdering people for kicks, that's a guilty pleasure. You know why? Because <laughs> you've done something wrong. You, have, you are guilty of murder. You have incurred guilt. If you are watching The Real Housewives of Atlanta, you haven't done anything wrong. There's no guilt involved. In <laughs> of course, we call it guilty pleasures because we're ashamed of them, because we've been taught that somehow these pleasures are wrong. It's really interesting because as children, we use pleasure to learn. Almost everything from the time we are born to about second, third grade, almost everything we learn is through some kind of game, through some kind of pleasure, because we've learned that if kids learn through pleasure, they'll actually learn. It's around the time that we start being able to teach ourselves things without having it be a game where we can actually make ourselves sit down and focus on something even if it's not fun that we start judging our own pleasures and we start saying well this doesn't have any educational value so therefore it's not worth anything i had a friend one of the smartest guys i've ever known he was bilingual he had a bachelor's of science in both mathematics and in business. He read Herodotus for fun, okay? Who reads Herodotus for fun? Nobody, nobody does, that's who. Um, and one day we're sitting around talking and he says to me, I have to tell you something. And, I, and like, he was clearly a little uncomfortable and I said, okay. And he said, I really like NASCAR. And I had a moment, <laughs> I had a moment because first of all, I don't understand NASCAR. I'm just gonna admit it. The cars go around in a circle. I don't understand it, okay? But also, let's face it, there's a stigma attached to NASCAR. Like when I think of NASCAR, I think of rednecks and beer, okay? <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh my God, is this something I never knew about? Does this change everything I know about this person? And then I stood back and I was like, no, of course it doesn't. All it tells me is that he likes to watch cars go around in a circle. That's the only new information that I have about this dude. So I said to him, okay, tell me about NASCAR. T 
tell me about tell me about these cars going around in a circle. To this day, I still don't understand. His explanation did not make it any clearer for me. But what it did do was it allowed him to know that if he came to me with other stuff, there was a pretty good chance I wasn't going to judge. That I was just going to sit back and be like, okay, tell me about that. And our relationship got a lot better for it. I have found overwhelmingly in my life, if I say to someone, yeah, I read trashy romance novels, and their first reaction is, oh. oh. <laughs> but that's not someone I'm going to say something more to. That's not someone I'm going to talk about my deep life problems about. Because if they think I'm less intelligent because I read a genre book, what are they going to think when I tell them something big about myself? So basically, I really want you to think about the next time someone comes to you and they're your friend and they say to you, you know what I love? I love to read all the tabloids, all of them, all, every single one. <laughs> don't, don't sit there and say, oh. I mean, if that's your first reaction and it has to be okay, fine. But your second reaction should be, you know what I like? I like to eat all the Twinkies, all of them. <laughs> and then you can talk about your tabloids and Twinkies and everybody will be so much happier for it. Thank you.